We shall never surrender. Churchill is a one to three player game where each player takes the role of one of the big three supreme allied leaders in World War II, Roosevelt, Stalin, and of course, Winston Churchill. The game has players competing against each other for victory points, but also requires each player to cooperate with the others. A player that accumulates an inordinate amount of victory points may lose the game by driving the other two powers into an alliance against him. To win, therefore, the player must obtain the highest number of victory points and win by a close margin. Thus, the victory conditions reflect the tensions and struggles existing within the alliance, as the powers prosecute the war to its conclusion and make efforts at shaping the post-war world. The game includes one 22 inch by 34 inch mounted map board. The map board is divided into two major displays. The conference display is where most of the interaction between the players will take place. It is represented by a circular conference table similar to the ones used in the actual allied conferences. In the middle of the display is the center of the table space or zero space. Radiating from the center are tracks for each of the sides with their respective leader chairs at the end of the tracks. The military display is divided into the European and Pacific theaters. Germany is in the center of the European theater while Japan is in the center of the Pacific theater. A number of front tracks divided into spaces spiral into the Axis powers. Front markers represent the current position of Allied forces on a particular front. During the war phase, all front markers must attempt to advance into the next space along the track, which is called the entry space. If one or more fronts enter an Axis power space, that Axis power surrenders. Adjacent to the front track spaces are spaces for countries and colonies, where the powers may place their clandestine network and political alignment markers. Clandestine networks represent the support by a side to occupied resistance movements. Political alignment markers represent governments in exile sponsored by each of the Allied powers. In the atomic bomb status track, the United States and Great Britain advanced their research marker to deploy the bomb for its use against Japan, while the Soviets advanced their Manhattan spy ring marker in their efforts to steal atomic bomb technology. There is also a scoring track to keep tally of the victory points won by each of the sides. Offensive support and naval support markers are used to increase the strength of the fronts when attempting to advance along their respective tracks. Issue markers are kept on the conference display until they are selected during the agenda segment and placed in the center of the table space. 
During the game, each of the powers also receive production markers. These are converted into offensive support and naval support markers, or can be used to convert political military issues into political alignment and clandestine network markers. There are four leader cards, one for Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, and if Roosevelt dies, one for Harry Truman. Each leader has special abilities, penalties for use, and in the card is specified the side's national characteristic. Each side also has 21 staff cards. Each card represents a historical character with a value and text that describes his special abilities or penalties for the card's use. Staff cards are played during conferences to nominate an issue as well as to advance or debate an issue. There are 30 conference cards. Conference cards are revealed at the start of each conference and they contain instructions that pertain to each of the sides as well as military events and events affecting clandestine networks and political alignment in countries and colonies. The rulebook is 36 pages long, although the actual rules needed to play the game cover 17 pages. One of the most innovative aspects of this game is the way that victory is defined. The game uses a victory point schedule to determine the number of victory points gained by advancing fronts, the surrender of Axis powers, and atomic bomb research. Because the game involves the interactions between competing members of an alliance, obtaining the highest number of victory points does not always translate in winning the game. The game ends after the 10th conference or during any conference if both Axis powers have surrendered. There are three endgame situations. In the first situation, if both Axis powers have surrendered and the difference between the highest victory point score and the lowest victory point score is 15 or less, then the player with the most victory points wins. In the second situation, if both Axis powers have surrendered and the difference between the highest victory point score and lowest victory point score is greater than 15, a die is rolled. The die result, which will be 1 to 6, is added to 15 to obtain what we call the new value, which will be somewhere between 16 and 21. If the difference between the high score and the low score is equal or less than the new value, the player with the high score wins. But if the difference between the high score and low score is greater than this new value, the player with the second highest score wins. And there is a third and last endgame situation. If at the end of the last conference at least one Axis power has not surrendered, then each player rolls one die and modifies his score as follows. The highest scoring player subtracts the die roll from his score. The second highest scorer subtracts half of the die roll value rounded up from his score. And the lowest scorer adds the die roll value to his score. The player with the highest modified score wins the game. So, as you can see, this game places you in a completely different mindset than other purely competitive games. Players must work towards their nation's particular goals, but within the framework of an alliance, and win on the basis of victory points by a close margin. The campaign scenario consists of 10 conferences. There are also two shorter scenarios included, a training scenario comprising three conferences and a tournament scenario composed of the last five conferences during the war. We will play the extended example of play contained in the rulebook. This is an example of the first conference, which is conference number eight, of the three conference training scenario.
From the conference deck, we pull the cards for conferences 8, 9, and 10. Now we set up the uh, units and markers on the map. Let's take a look first at the situation in the European theater. Soviet forces are currently in Prussia with their sights into advancing to East Germany. We place the uh, Soviet front marker there. The Soviets have clandestine networks in all but two of the countries in the Eastern Front. They have political alignment markers in Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Baltic states. And the British have clandestine networks in Greece and Poland. Meanwhile, in the Western theater, the Allies have advanced into the Rhineland and are about to enter West Germany. European theater command is in the hands of the Americans, who have two clandestine and two political alignment markers in France and Czechoslovakia. The British have two clandestine and political alignment markers in the Netherlands and Belgium. The Allies also have five naval support markers in the Western theater box. Meanwhile, in the Mediterranean theater, the Allied advance is currently in central Italy. The British have two clandestine and two political alignment markers in the Middle East and Persia. And there are three naval support markers for this theater. Now let's take a look at the starting situation in the Pacific theater. In the Central Pacific, the Allied advance is currently in the Mariana Islands. And the Allies have three naval support markers allocated to this specific theater. In the Southwest Pacific, the Allies are currently at Vogelkop, New Guinea. And three naval support markers are allocated to this theater. In the China Burma India theater, the Allied advance is currently in the starting box. The U.S. has clandestine networks in all colonies except Malaya, with political alignment markers in Siam and Cambodia, Laos. And finally, one naval support marker is allocated to this theater. In the Far East theater, the Soviet advance is currently at Nomohon. And the Pacific Theater Command is currently under the control of the United States. We place the global issue markers in the neutral position. We place the leader blocks in their respective spaces near the active band, and we place the uh, leader markers on their active sides. Now we place all conference issues markers, except the one for the second front, in their respective spaces on the board. And we place uh, alignment cylinders to be used to keep track of victory points for each of the sides on the victory point track. Each side starts the game with their respective leader and a deck of 21 staff cards. At the beginning of the conference phase, a set number of production markers is given to each of the sides. Six for the United States, four for the British, and three production markers for the Soviet Union. And at the beginning of the game, the Germans have six reserve armies. There's no German Navy in this scenario. It is assumed to be a force that has uh, uh, not enough strength to be represented in the game. The Japanese begin with four reserve armies and two Imperial Japanese Navy reserve units. Now we begin the game with the conference phase and there are three segments in the conference phase, the agenda segment, the meeting segment and the decision segment. We start 
with the agenda segment. We reveal the top conference card and we will implement its instructions. And we see that the conference card has instructions which are color coded. The green instructions pertain to the British, the red to the Soviets, the blue to the Americans, the gray refer to military events, and the white instructions refer to uh, events relating to clandestine networks and political alignment. So we start with the British event or instructions, Churchill, Mountbatten, and Cairo. The British have to use one production marker to place an offensive uh, support marker in the China-Burma-India theater. The British begin the conference with four production markers, so we will place one as a reminder in the China-Burma-India theater box, and this will serve as a reminder when the decision segment comes. We have to allocate production for the British that they have to uh, convert that production marker into an offensive support marker to be placed in that theater. Now we go to the Soviet instruction northern flank. If there are less than three naval support markers in the Arctic theater, there is only one, so that applies. We have U-boats and uh, we roll 1d6 on a 1 through 3. The Murmansk convoy arrives and the Soviets receive one production marker. Four through six, no convoy. The roll is a five, so the Soviets receive no additional production on account of the Murmansk convoy. Now the American instruction Roosevelt stays in Washington and Roosevelt cannot be used during this conference to advance an issue. He can still be used to debate an issue. So Roosevelt is active, he just can't uh, advance an issue, so we place this marker as a reminder. He may still debate issues. Next instruction, Leyte Golf, the Imperial Japanese Navy sorties in the Southwest Pacific Theater, and also one Japanese Reserve Army is placed in that theater. So as a reminder, we take one Imperial Japanese Navy unit and place it in the Southwest Pacific Theater box next to the Naval Support Marker and we place one Japanese Army in the entry space for the Southwest Pacific Theater front which is the Philippines. The last instruction partisan dispute we roll 1d6 on a 1 to 3 we roll that number of times on the poll mill table, political military table, and remove all clandestine networks from those locations. And a four through six, no effect. And the roll is a six, so there is no effect. Now after shuffling their respective staff decks, each of the players deals themselves seven staff cards. Each of the players now add to their seven staff card hand their respective leader card. Let's take a look at each of the players' hands. Let's take a look at the British hand, Sir Winston Churchill, Menzies, strength of one, Beaverbrook, Cunningham, strength of two, not very impressive, Portal, one. Dudley Pound, another one. So these are not uh, the kind of uh, staff cards that the British would probably want, but at least pretty strong unless uh, Churchill is active. And Bevin is a strong leader unless advancing a political military issue on the Soviet track where he loses one strength. Now let's see the Soviet hand. Stalin is a very interesting character here. He may go paranoid and uh, that could have a detrimental effect for the remainder of the conference if that happens. And uh, when you see the other Soviet characters and their staff, they tend to have low strength numbers because they were under a lot of pressure by their own leader. And some have interesting effects like Merkulov, who may send uh, the next uh, Soviet staff member to be uh, played to the Gulag. Here we have uh, Budioni with a strength of 5, unless Stalin is active, then that goes down to 3. 
Molotov, also a strength of five, strong uh, staff member. Malenkov, not very strong unless uh, advancing a strategic material issue. And here we have Kuznetsov. When you play his card, uh, naval marker goes to the Arctic theater box. And finally, Georgi Shukov, he's the uh, chief of staff. Uh, and that's why he has the uh, star here. Uh, instead of a printed strength number, every time you play a chief of staff card like Shukov's, you roll 1d6 and the result will be his strength. So that is the Soviet hand. And now let's see the American hand. We have Roosevelt. And he has to roll for health every time his card is used. And he may even die. But uh, let's see the other uh, characters we have here. Crowley, two strength. Embrick, one strength, not very impressive. Donovan is a two strength, but if advancing a political military issue, it goes up to five. Frank Walker, two strength. And if Roosevelt is active in the conference, it goes up to four. Morgenthau, four strength and five strength if it's... If he's advancing a global issue, Harriman, strength of four, and he may get a plus one. And finally, Harry Hopkins, strength of five. And uh, apparently he's not very friendly with uh, Truman. His strength goes down to two if Truman is the president. So that's the American hand. Now continuing with the agenda segment, each side selects one staff card to be played. And now we simultaneously reveal the card selected by each side. The staff member with the highest strength will be able to select one issue from the conference issues and place it in the center of the table and move that issue towards his chair, a number of spaces equal to uh, the uh, difference between uh, his strength and the lowest opposing strength. So we see that Beaverbrook has a strength of three, Crowley and Vosnesensky, strengths of two, and Beaverbrook, his strength actually increases by one because of the British national characteristic. As shown here in Churchill's leader card, the British have a national characteristic called Imperial Staff. Any staff card played during an agenda segment earns the British a plus one to that staff member's strength. Beaverbrook's uh, rating actually would be a four, and he would beat uh, Crowley's two as well as Vosnesensky's two. So the winner of the agenda segment is the United Kingdom. The British select one issue from the conference issues display, and they will select this two slash two political military issue. The number to the left represents the number of political alignment markers that this issue uh, creates and the number to the right the number of clandestine networks. Since the British selected this issue we place it in the center of the table and we move it a number of spaces towards the British chair equal to the difference between the British uh, strength, four, and the lowest strength, lowest opposing strength of two, so the difference is two. So we move it two spaces, and it is now in the number two British box. So the British won the agenda. They already placed an issue and moved it towards their track. Now the player to the left of the player that won the agenda, the Soviets, now have to select two issues and place them in the center of the table. The Soviets select a US production issue and another political military issue, the 1 slash 3. And they are placed in the center of the table. Now the Americans select two issues. The Americans want the uh, Soviets to get more involved against Japan, so they select the USSR declares war on Japan issue as well as a Soviet directed offensive issue. And they are placed in the center of the table. And now the British select two issues. 
The British want to have control of the European theater of command, so they take the European theater leadership issue as well as the global issue marker. And they go to the center of the table. And we place the three staff cards played in the agenda segment in the discard pile. Now we go to the meeting segment. The British won the agenda segment, so the meeting segment commences with the side immediately to the left, the Soviets, and the Soviets select a staff card to advance an issue. So the Soviets will play this card, Sevolod Merkulov, the People's Commissaire of State Security. He has a strength of one, which is really weak, but if used to advance a political military issue, the strength goes up to two. And he also has a gulag effect. If we play his card during the next turn, after playing or discarding another Soviet staff card, we have to roll 1d6, and on a result of one, that staff member is arrested and goes to the gulag. So Merkulov is played, and the political military issue is moved two spaces and is now in the number two box of the Soviet track. Now the Americans have a chance to debate that issue, and they decide not to, and the British now may debate the issue, and they also decline debating the issue. So the uh, issue marker stays for now in the number two Soviet track box, and Merkulov's card goes to the discard pile. And now it's the Americans' turn, and they select General Stanley Enbrick, chairman of the Joint Strategic Survey Committee. He has a strength of one, but his strength increases by two if used to advance a directed offensive issue. So his card is played to advance the Soviet directed offensive issue, which is moved three spaces to the number three box on the U.S. track. Now the British may debate the issue, but they decline. The Soviets will debate. And the Soviets decide to send... Semyon Budioni, the cavalry inspector of the Red Army, he has a printed strength of five, which is decreased by two if Stalin is active in the conference, which he is, and that would reduce uh, his strength to three, but his strength would be increased by one because of the Soviet national characteristic in this game, which is called Niet, and that is whenever a Soviet staff member will debate an issue, his strength is increased by one. So Budieni's net strength is four. And by debating the issue, Budieni causes that the issue marker be moved four spaces, and it is now in the number one box of the USSR track. So we place Embrick in the discard pile, as well as Budioni, but because the Soviets played a staff card to debate an issue, they have an option in the next turn to pass, and uh, they must either play a staff card or pass. And whatever happens, we remove that pass marker, so they only have a chance to pass immediately after they debate an issue. Now we move on to the British turn. And the British play... Sir Andrew Cunningham, the first Sea Lord, he has an attribute that if he is used to advance the European leadership change, his strength goes up by two to four. So Cunningham's card is played and the European theater leadership is moved to the British number four box. The Russians decline debating the issue and so do the Americans. And Cunningham's card is placed the discard pile. Now it's the Soviets turn to play a card but in order to preserve cards for now they decide to pass so we remove the pass marker. Now it's the Americans turn and the Americans will play William Donovan of the Office of Strategic Services. He has a strength of two but if used to advance a political military issue his strength is five. So, he will advance this political-military issue from the number two box of the Soviet track 
to the number three box of the U.S. track. And neither the British nor the Soviets will debate the issue. And Donovan's card goes to the discard pile. Now we go to the British turn. And the British decide to play Sir Charles Portal. He has a strength of one, which is really weak, but if uh, used to uh, advance an issue on the US track, his strength increases by two, and there is an issue on the US track, which is the one slash three Paul Mill issue. So he advances that issue three spaces back to the center of the table. Now the Soviets may debate the issue and they decline. The Americans, on the other hand, will debate the issue. They select Frank Walker's card, but not to play this card to debate the issue, but to discard the card in order for the Americans to play their leader card, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Remember that uh, as per the conference card, Roosevelt could not advance an issue, but he can certainly debate one. So Roosevelt is used to debate this issue. So Roosevelt's card is played to debate the issue and the political military issue marker reaches Roosevelt's chair. The Americans have captured this issue. Note that the attribute for Roosevelt doesn't apply because his card was not played on a global issue. However, because his card was used, we have to roll to see if uh, Roosevelt survives this health check. We roll 2d6, and on a roll of 2 or 3, he dies and would be replaced by Harry Truman. The roll is a 9, so Roosevelt passes his health check. So we place Portal on the British discard pile and Walker as well as Roosevelt on the American discard pile. And we also place this uh, US debate pass marker. That means that during the next American turn, the Americans can uh, play a staff card to advance an issue or they can pass and uh, play would pass to the next player. Because Roosevelt's card was used, we place his uh, block on the inactive band and we also flip this uh, marker to remind us that he is inactive for the remainder of the conference. So now it is the Soviets turn and the Soviets will go here for a bold move. They will play their Minister of Foreign Affairs Vyacheslav Molotov. He has a strength of five but if played to advance a global issue his strength is six. Molotov's card is played and the global issue marker is advanced to the number six box on the Soviet track almost on Stalin's chair. The Americans have the option to debate the issue but having played their leader's card they decline to do so and now the British must decide if they will debate the issue. The British will discard Sir Dudley Pound's card, his rating is only one, for the purpose of using their leader, Sir Winston Churchill, to debate the issue. Now, note that Churchill has an attribute that if his card is played on a global issue, the British gain one political lineman marker, but he also has health issues, and he'll have to roll after his card is played to see if he... Uh, is inactive during the next conference or not. So by debating with Churchill, the global issue marker has moved seven boxes, reaching the number one box on the British track. Because Churchill's card was played on a global issue, the British gain one political alignment marker, which we place for now near Churchill's chair. And now we have to roll for Churchill's health. 2d6. On a roll of 2 through 4, he suffers a heart attack and will not be active during the next conference. The roll is an 8 and he passes his health check. So we place Molotov on the Soviet discard pile, Pound and Churchill on the British discard pile, and because the British debated the issue, we place the uh, 
British debate pass option marker on the British discard pile as a reminder that they can pass or advance an issue in their next turn. Because Churchill's card was played, we move his block to the inactive band and we flip the marker also. And he is inactive for the remainder of this conference. Play passes now to the Americans, but uh, they decide to pass. And we remove the pass option marker from their discard pile. And now it's the British turn. And they also decide to pass. And now play passes to the Soviets. So the Soviets decide to discard the lowly Georgi Malenkov for the purpose of playing their leader. Joseph Stalin, and Stalin has uh, various attributes. If he's played on a political military issue, the Soviets immediately receive one clandestine network marker, and if he's used to advance the atomic bomb research issue, he cannot be debated by another leader. He also has an effect that he may become paranoid, so we have to roll 2d6 after his card is used. And uh, if he becomes paranoid, all the remaining uh, staff members during this conference have their strength reduced by one. So Stalin is played to advance the political military issue, and it will be moved seven spaces to the number five box on the Soviet track. And neither the Americans nor the British will debate the issue. Because Stalin was played on a political military issue, the Soviets immediately receive one clandestine network marker. And we will place it for now next to Stalin's chair. And now we roll 2d6 to see if Stalin becomes paranoid. If he does, the strength of all remaining uh, Soviet staff cards are reduced by one for this conference. The roll is a six, so Stalin does not become paranoid in this conference. And we place Malenkov and Stalin in the Soviet discard pile and a pass marker. And Stalin's card having been played, he now becomes inactive and we so mark it. So now it's the Americans' turn and the Americans will play their Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr. He has a strength of four, but it increases to five if used to advance a global issue. And he will be used to advance the global issue, which is moved to the number four box on the US track. The British decide not to debate the issue. The Russians will do so. Soviets have two cards left, their Chief of Staff Shukov and Nikolai Kuznetsov, the Chief of the Soviet Navy and People's Commissar, and Kuznetsov will be played to debate the issue. He has an attribute that if his card is played, we place a naval marker in the Arctic theater box. So Kuznetsov is played and strength is actually five because of the plus one for the Soviet national characteristic Niet. So the global marker is now moved to the number one space in the Soviet track. And we place a naval support marker in the Arctic theater. So Morgenthau goes into the American discard pile, Kuznetsov into the Soviet discard pile, and we place a pass marker on top of the Soviet discard pile. Now play passes to the British. The British have three cards left, and they will play the Deputy Prime Minister and Secretary of State, Clement Attlee. He has a strength of five, but he has an attribute that decreases his strength by two if Churchill is still active, and that's because Attlee was the leader of the opposing Labour Party. Churchill was in the Conservative Party. And uh, Churchill is inactive, so uh, luckily for the British, Attlee's strength is five. The play of at least card moves a global issue to the number four box on the British track. The Russians have a chance to debate the issue and they will do so. 
They have their last card, the Soviet chief of staff, Georgi Shukov. And notice that his rating is a star. That means that his strength is equal to one die roll. And of course, because he is debating an issue, we add one for the uh, Niet national Soviet characteristic. So Shukov's card is played, and we roll 1d6. The roll is a 3 modified to a 4, so the global issue marker moves back to the center of the table. So at Lee goes to the British discard pile, as well as Shukov. And we place the marker, but it's not going to make a difference. The Soviets just ran out of cards for this conference. So it is now the Soviets' turn, but they have no cards to play, so we pass now to the Americans' turn. The Americans have two cards left, and they will play their special envoy, Avril Harriman. He has a strength of four, unless he is uh, advancing an issue on the Soviet track, or Churchill is active. Churchill is inactive, but uh, Harriman will be used to advance an issue which is currently on the Soviet track, the Soviet-directed offensive issue. So he has a strength of five. So Harriman's card is played, and the issue is moved to the number four box of the U.S. track. The British do not debate the issue, and the Soviets just can't. And Harriman goes to the discard pile. And now it's the British turn. With two cards left, the British will play the Minister of Labor and National Service, Ernest Bevan. He has an impressive strength of five, but if uh, used to advance a political military issue, the strength decreases by one to four. And Bevin will be played to advance the uh, two slash two political military issue, so he has a strength of four, and the issue is moved to the number one box on the Soviet track. The Russians, since they don't have any cards left, cannot debate the issue, and the Americans decline to do so. So Bevin goes to the discard pile. Now it's the Soviets' turn, but they don't have any cards. So now we move to the American turn. The Americans have one card left. Harry Hopkins, presidential advisor, strength of five. His strength decreases significantly if uh, Truman is president and if uh, he is uh, involved in a strategic material issue and Roosevelt is alive, then he can have a strength of one through six at the American player's option. But in this case, he will be played to advance the global issue five spaces to the number five box on the U.S. track. The British only have one card left that wouldn't make any difference if it is used to debate the issue, and the Russians can't debate the issue because they have no cards. So into the discard pile, Harry Hopkins goes. And now to the last turn of this conference, the British turn. They have their last card, which is the card for Sir Stuart Menzies, alias C, Chief of the Secret Intelligence Service, with a whopping one rating. But if used to advance a political military issue, his rating would be four. And the British could uh, use Menzies' card to advance this political military issue into the number three box of their track. However, that would uh, really throw a wrench into relations between the British and the Soviets because if the British do that, the Soviets would win no issues in this conference. So uh, the British will be very diplomatic about things. They will play Sir Stuart Menzies to move another issue, in which case his strength is only one, the U.S. production issue, which is moved to the number one box on the British track. Since the other sides have no cards, the issue cannot be debated. And Menzies is placed in the British discard pile. Now we determine which side won the conference, and that is the side that won the most issues. An issue is won by a side if the issue is moved into that side's chair. An issue is also won by one side if, at the end of the conference, the issue is on that side's track. So we start with the British. They won the American production issue and the uh, European theater leadership issue. That is two issues. 
Soviets won the two slash two political military issue, so they only have one issue. The Americans had advanced the one slash three political military issue into Roosevelt's chair, so now we add the global issue and the Soviet directed offensive issue. So the Americans have three issues won. And because they have the most issues won, they are the conference winners. And uh, that uh, entails that uh, they receive three victory points. And that's the end of the conference and the meeting segment. Now we go to the decision segment. And uh, there are seven activities here. And the order is uh, the player, which is clockwise, from the player that won the meeting segment. The conference was won by the Americans. So we begin each activity now with the British, followed by the Soviets, and then the Americans. The first activity is place directed offensive markers. And only the Americans won a directed offensive marker. And the Americans will place the Soviet-directed offensive marker into the Manchuria box. Manchuria is the entry space for the Soviet Far East Theater. The entry space is always the space which is next to be entered by the respective uh, front marker, which is on each theater. Now, this uh, directed offensive and an attack on Manchuria requires the Soviets to have declared war on Japan or the Emperor of Japan to have surrendered. Now we proceed to the next activity, which is to determine if any conditional issue applies. In this game, there are only two issues which are conditional issues. And one of those is the USSR declares war on Japan and the other one is the second front issue, but in this particular scenario, this issue has already been considered to have been uh, triggered. So conditional issues are different from regular issues in that they are triggered or they happen if they end the conference in the center of the table. Regular issues are won by each of the sides by moving them into their chairs or their tracks at the end of the conference. But conditional issues, if the conference ends and they are at the center of the table, they are in effect. And therefore, in this case, the USSR declares war on Japan. And as we stated before, that was a precondition for the Soviets to be able to attack and move into Manchuria. So. Now that directed offensive that was placed will take effect. The next activity now is production, where each player determines how many production counters they have to allocate. The British started the turn with four production markers, three which you see next to Churchill's chair, and one which we placed earlier in the China-Burma-India theater box as a result of the uh, British instruction of the conference card, which uh, mandates that we convert one British production to an offensive support marker in that theater. The British won a US production marker. That means that they take one production marker from the Americans. So the British have four production, plus the one in the China, Burma, India theater, and also the European theater leadership issue, which allows them to uh, convert it into two support markers. The British will convert all their production markers, including the one they gained from the Americans, into offensive support markers. And they are converted on a one-to-one -one basis. And the European theater leadership issue is also converted into two offensive support markers. And they also convert the British production that is allocated to the China Burma India Theater into an offensive support marker and we will place it in the entry space for that theater which is the one directly in front to the front marker which is the Burma space. So now we place the uh, six offensive support markers left. 
Five support markers are placed in the entry space for the Western Theater, which is West Germany. And they will be used in the military segment to try to help that front advance into the attacked space. And the remaining offensive support marker will be placed in the entry space for the Mediterranean Theater, which is Northern Italy. Now it's the Soviets' turn to allocate their production. They only have three production markers, and uh, Stalin is not very happy because of that. And uh, Roosevelt proposes to uh, provide to Stalin two support markers if Stalin forgoes his 2 slash 2 political military issue. That is, he forgoes converting it into two political alignment and uh, clandestine network markers. And this is the type of negotiation that can occur during this game and you know, all these types of deals are not binding on the party. So Stalin decides to accept the American offer and he will forego converting his political military uh, issue marker. And he, uh, of course, is counting on the Americans in their turn to allocate two support markers to the Soviet Eastern Front. And the Soviets convert their three production markers into offensive support markers. The Soviet-directed offensive marker forces them to place two offensive support markers in Manchuria. And the Soviets place their last offensive support marker in East Germany, of course, they are counting on the American promise of placing two of their offensive support markers there. Now it's the Americans' turn to allocate production. In addition to converting a production marker into an offensive support or naval support marker, one production marker can be used to convert a political military issue marker. Now, the Americans will use this production marker to convert this 1 slash 3 political military issue marker. So the Americans will receive one political alignment and three clandestine network markers. And these markers will be placed during the war phase on the military display. And they will convert each of their remaining production markers into offensive support markers. The Americans, because they have command of the European theater and the Pacific theater, receive one support marker for each, which has to be placed in that respective theater. So for the European theater, there will be an offensive support marker and the Pacific theater, a naval support marker. So the Americans place two of their five offensive support markers in the entry space of the Western theater, which is West Germany. They place an offensive support marker in the entry space for the Southwest Pacific Theater, the Philippines, and a naval support marker also to support the offensive in that theater. Having two offensive support markers left, one is placed in the entry space of the Central Pacific Theater. And the Americans placed their last offensive support marker in East Germany. If you remember, the Americans had promised the Soviets two offensive support markers in exchange for the Soviets uh, forfeiting their 2 slash 2 political military uh, issue marker. And this is the kind of uh, fate that can occur to deals of this sort in this game. Uh, these type of deals are not enforceable. So uh, this is the end of the war and uh, each of the sides are looking more at uh, how the uh, world is going to be configured and less about honoring their commitments. The next activity is theater leadership. And if you recall, the British won the European theater leadership issue and they gained two support markers for that. Now they decide if they want to be the leaders of the European theater or they'll give it to the Americans. And the British decide to take command of the European theater and we mark it accordingly. The next activity is atomic bomb research. There is an A-bomb research issue, which in this particular conference was not selected, and therefore this uh, 
activity would be skipped now, but let's take a look at the A-bomb research track. This is the atomic bomb research track, and at the beginning of this scenario, the Soviet Manhattan spiring marker starts here in the letter to Roosevelt space, and the Americans have a lead. They start here in the Hanford space. If any of the sides win the atomic bomb research issue, we roll 1d6 for the Americans, and on a 4 through 6, the American marker is advanced one space. Now, if the Soviets win the atomic bomb research issue, in addition to making the die roll for the American marker, the Soviet spiring, Manhattan spiring marker, advances automatically to the next space. Now, uh, production markers can be used to uh, serve as a plus one die roll modifier for the American die roll. And at the end of the game, depending on the position where the markers ended, there's a number of victory points that can be awarded to each of the sides. Now, if the American marker ends uh, in the Trinity atomic bomb space, it has complied with one of the three conditions for Japanese surrender. The other two are that uh, Germany has surrendered in the same conference as when this happened or before, and that the Soviet Far East Front is in or beyond the Manchuria space. Now, as stated before, in this particular playthrough or example, the, uh, none of the sides uh, took a hold of the atomic bomb research issue, so there is no action in the atomic bomb research track in this particular instance. And now we go to the last activity of the decision segment, the global issue activity. And uh, global issues are issues that each of the sides have that pertain to the shaping of the world after the war. The United States has two global issues, United Nations, self-determination, the British have two, colonialism and free Europe, and also the Soviets have two spheres of influence and communist gatherers. And as you can see, uh, each global issue of one side has uh, an impact on the uh, triggering of a global issue of the other side. So the United States will have a global issue to fight out, metaphorically, right, of course, with Britain, and another one to be faced off against Russia, and Britain and Russia have the same situation. Now, in this particular uh, case, the United States won the global issue, and uh, so they select which of their two global issues they will put into effect. And at the beginning of the game, these markers start in the neutral position, and they have effects on play. Right now, this marker in the neutral position means that it costs one political alignment marker to remove an opponent's political alignment marker. Now the United States selects to put into effect the United Nations. And now it will cost two political alignment markers to remove an opponent's political alignment marker. Let's say that in the next turn, the Soviets win the global issue. So if that is the case, the Soviets then could either move this marker to the spheres of influence and trigger that global issue or move this marker, but this marker never returns once it's, it leaves the neutral space there. It is moved completely to the other side and uh, the communist cadres global issue would be triggered. But for now, the Americans have created the United Nations and it costs two political alignment markers to remove an opponent's political alignment mark. So now we go to the war phase. There are three segments here, the clandestine network segment, the political alignment segment, and the military segment. We start with the clandestine network segment. At the beginning of this segment, each side receives one clandestine network marker for each of their intelligence uh, agencies. The United States receives one for the OSS, the British one for the MI6, and the Russians one for their NK. VD. In this phase, each of the sides places its clandestine networks in the uh, countries in the military display. Now, the side that goes first is the side that has the most clandestine network markers, and that's the United States that has four. 
the United States places a clandestine network a marker in Denmark and another one in Malaya. The Americans have two more clandestine network markers to be placed. They use the next one to eliminate the Soviet clandestine network in Austria and their last network marker to be placed right there in Austria. The Americans finished placing their clandestine networks and now we continue clockwise and it's Great Britain's turn. The British only have one clandestine network marker to place and they use it to eliminate the American clandestine network in Malaya. Now it's the Soviets turn to place their clandestine networks. The Soviets used their first clandestine network marker to eliminate the American clandestine network in Austria and the second one to be placed also there. Now we go to the political alignment segment and starting with the side that has the most political alignment markers, uh, that side places them first. However, the uh, Americans have one as well as the British, the Russians have none to place and because the Americans have the arsenal of democracy and national characteristic, which uh, they decide uh, tiebreakers, they decide to let the British place their political alignment marker first. A political alignment marker can only be placed in a country where a side has at least one clandestine network or it can be uh, used to eliminate a political alignment marker of an opponent that is already placed in a country. The British, having already one clandestine network in Greece, now place a political alignment marker there. Now the Americans place their political alignment marker and the Americans place it in Denmark. And now we proceed to the last segment of the war phase. This is the military segment. It is composed of two activities, Axis Reserve Placement and Front Advancement. In the Axis Reserve Placement activity, we follow a series of rules to see where these reserve units will be placed. The map has a summary of these rules that pertain to each of the theaters, to the European theater, as well as to the Pacific. Let's begin with the European theater. If any front is attempting to enter Germany, two German armies have to stay in Germany. None of the fronts are attempting to enter Germany. They're not adjacent to uh, the Germany space, so that rule doesn't apply. We place a German army in the Soviet Eastern Entry Space. The next rule that applies is if the Normandy space has been previously entered, we place two German armies in the entry space of the front which is closer to Germany, but if we have two that are equidistant, like we have here, we place one in the entry space of each. And now the remaining three armies are randomly distributed between the three front tracks. We roll a six-sided die, one or two, it'll go to the western front, three or four to the eastern front, five to the Mediterranean, and six to the Arctic. And if there is a naval marker in the Arctic front, we uh, remove a naval marker, otherwise we treat the six as a five and place the army in the Mediterranean entry space. So we roll for the first German army. The roll is a four, so it goes to the eastern front. Now we roll for the second German army. The roll is a five, so it is placed in northern Italy. And now we roll for the last German reserve army. The roll is a two, so it is placed in the western front entry space. And uh, the Japanese reserve armies, we've already allocated one to the Philippines as a result of the instruction mandated here for Leyte Gulf, where we had to place a Japanese reserve in the Southwest Pacific Theater, and the Philippines is the uh, entry space in the Southwest Pacific. We also, according to the same instruction, allocated one Imperial Japanese Navy Reserve to the Southwest Pacific Theater and we place it right next to our naval 
uh, support markers. Now we place the reserve Japanese armies according to the uh, rules of placement here. The first one is if any friend is attempting to enter Japan, all Japanese armies are placed in Japan, but no front is adjacent to the Japan space, so we skip that rule. If the USSR front has exited the Far East theater box, we place two Japanese armies in the Far East front's entry space. And the Russian front is at Nomohon, so uh, it has exited the Far East theater initial box, so two Japanese armies are placed in Manchuria. Next, if any front is attempting to enter a B-29 space, we place a Japanese army in each of these locations. First, if there are multiple such spaces, we start Central Pacific, Southwest Pacific, and finally China, Burma, India. There is a front attempting to enter into Iwo Jima, which is a B-29 space, so the last Japanese reserve army goes there. Now we place one Imperial Japanese Navy Reserve. And uh, we saw that the uh, conference card called for an Imperial Japanese Navy Reserve to be placed in the Southwest Pacific Theater, so we placed it there. So the next step is to resolve the Battle of Leyte Gulf. We eliminate one U.S. Naval Support Marker on account of the Japanese Navy Reserve, and now we have to roll 1d6 to see if that uh, Japanese Reserve unit is eliminated permanently from the game or it returns to Japan. On a 1 through 4, it is permanently eliminated, so we roll 1d6. The roll is a 2, so we remove the Japanese Navy Reserve unit permanently from the game. Note that there are two Imperial Japanese Navy units in the game, but only one can be used at a time. So the Japanese still have this one for the next turn. And now we proceed with the front advancement activity of the military segment. And here each front has to attempt to advance into its respective entry space. A front will advance if it rolls a 1d10 which is equal or less than its modified strength. A front's base strength is 2, and we add 2 for each offensive support marker. So here we see 2 for the Russian front plus 2 offensive support markers, and its strength is currently at 6, but a front's strength is weakened by 2 for each enemy reserve army. There are 3 there, so it would be a minus 6, so 6 minus 6 is 0. And if the modified strength is zero or less, a die roll is not even necessary. And in this particular case, the Soviets fail to enter and advance into East Germany. Now here the Allies on the Western Front will attempt to advance into West Germany. We start with a base strength of two. There are seven offensive support markers. That's, that's a plus 14. For 16, we subtract four for the German reserve armies the total modified strength of our army is 12. Because the front's modified strength is 10 or greater, in this case 12, the advance will be automatic. Now we have to check to see if there's a breakthrough. A breakthrough is an advance of two spaces, and if that happens, the Allies would move into Germany and cause the surrender of Germany. For a breakthrough to occur, we have to roll a die, and on a modified uh, roll of 10 or higher, it occurs, and we add plus 1 for each point of a front's modified strength, which is greater than 10. The front's strength is 12, so we would add 2 to the die roll. So we roll 1d10 and add 2. On a result of 10 or higher, the Allies move into Germany. The roll is a 3 modified to a 5, so the breakthrough does not occur. But the British and Americans move into West Germany and they gain 5 victory points each. Also, we remove permanently one German reserve unit. Now we go to resolve the possible advance into Northern Italy. 
base strength of two, we add two for the offensive support marker, that's four, minus two for the German reserves, a total of two. So the Allies need one or two on a ten-sided die. We roll one d10. The roll is a five, and the advance on northern Italy fails. Now to the Pacific Theater. Let's start with the Southwest Pacific. The advance can be attempted because there are three naval support markers uh, in the Southwest Pacific Theater. So we can attempt the advance. We have a base strength of two. Plus two for offensive support is four. Minus two for the Japanese Army Reserve. It is two. So we roll 1d10. And the result is a three, and the Allies fail to advance into the Philippines. Now to the Central Pacific Theater. There are also three naval support markers, so the Allies can attempt the amphibious attack here on Iwo Jima. Two plus two for the offensive support is four minus two for the Japanese reserve. Also, two or less needed to advance. And the result is a 2, and the uh, Allies successfully advance into Iwo Jima, and the Americans earn 2 victory points. Now the Soviets will attempt to advance into Manchuria. They have a base strength of 2 for the front, 2 offensive support markers, which increases uh, their strength to 6, minus four for the reserve Japanese armies for a total modified strength of two. So they need a one or a two. So we roll one d10. But the result is a four. So the Soviets fail to advance into Manchuria. The Japanese armies are returned to Japan and we eliminate the support markers. And that's the end of the front advancement uh, step and the end of the military segment and the war phase. And now we pass to the post-mortem phase. In the post-mortem phase, uh, if both Germany and Japan have surrendered, the game ends and we determine the winner. And if this is the conclusion of uh, the 10th conference or the last turn of any scenario, we also determine the winner. And if both Axis countries have not surrendered and this is not the 10th uh, conference, we begin the next conference. This concludes this video presentation of Churchill's extended example play. This video covered one full conference and as you can see a lot happens in one conference including things not shown here. Each of the sides has its own characteristics, strengths and weaknesses. In sum, this is a highly innovative and replayable game. The conference system is a brilliant and exciting mechanic which could be implemented to simulate other pivotal historical situations, events which are seldom recreated in gaming, such as the Treaty of Versailles or the Congress of Vienna. Whoever thought that a game about meetings around a table between competing allies could be so entertaining? I hope this video gives you an idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.